Hello, everyone. Um, before starting, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here. Um, as I said, this work was done at the University of Maryland when I was part of the Gould Lab. Since then, I moved to the University of Cyprus. It is a small island for those that they don't know in the middle of the Mediterranean. Um, so today I will be talking about the uh, interactions between corticotropin releasing factor, CRF, as you're going to uh, listen to me uh, referring to today, and the, um, in regards with the response of ketamine and to r 6 r agent K. So you've seen this a lot throughout this conference. So we all know here that uh, ketamine uh, compared to the classical antidepressants is very exciting because of the uh, rapid, uh, rapid uh, effects as well as the sustained effects, um, as you see here. And then uh, our group uh, mainly concentrated on the investigation of the active metabolites of ketamine. And I'm not gonna go uh, too much into it because you already have seen this a lot in this conference. So we know that uh, ketamine, the parent drug initially is metabolized to uh, norketamine and to the hydro norketamine, which doesn't uh, cross the blood brain barrier. But then norketamine metabolites to several hydroxy norketamines, which the most uh, high, the highest levels that is found in uh, in plasma uh, in humans is the 2S6S and 2R6R agent K. Thus, initially we uh, we concentrated on the study of uh, 2R, uh, 2R6R and 2S6S. Um, so just to put this into perspective, now 2R6R is actually under uh, clinical trials. We are at the phase one uh, study, and then hopefully if everything uh, goes well, it will move on to the phase two trials. Um, this is um, an effort led by the NIH and uh, Carlos, uh, among others. So um, there are several mechanisms that are suggested on how ketamine or its metabolite might work. And here in this is very intimidating, but basically what we have is four main mechanisms. The first one is through the disinhibition. Uh, so the ketamine blocks the, um, binds on the NMDA, on the GABAergic interneuron, which then uh, results into this increase in uh, glutamate release. Um, then the second is through the blockade of the extra synaptic NMDA receptors uh, or the blockade of uh, spontaneous NMDA receptors that Lisa talked about yesterday. And the last mechanism is that I'm going to be mainly concentrating on is uh, through the active metabolite um, agent K, which we know that it leads to increase in glutamate release, but we don't really know exactly how this is done currently. So um, back in the day when I was first starting uh, my, my postdoc in the, in the Gold Lab, uh, we came across this paper that showed that ketamine might be more efficacious in people that have higher anxiety and depression. As you see here in the, in the Hamilton and the Mandra scale, in the Mandra scale that uh, the people that they have anxious depression, they responded better um, with, uh, with ketamine. So then uh, we started thinking like why this might happening and when it comes to anxiety, at least as a preclinical background and also it's true in humans, uh, in mind comes the HPA axis. So what is happening usually when we are stressed, we have the release of CRF from the hypothalamus and then we have a cascade of events happening, which results in the release of glucocorticoids. And then in healthy humans, we have these uh, recycle negative feedback loop to bring back the stress levels. Now in depressed patients, we have this dysregulation of the HPA axis, which results in higher corticosterone levels and higher CRF levels. And um, as usually CRF, how it does exert this effect is from binding of the, on the CRF1 receptor. There is a CRF2 receptor, which I'm not gonna be talking much today. Uh, but also in humans, it's evident that there is increased CRF concentration in the CSF in patients that they've been through child abuse or neglect, major depression, PTSD, antisocial personality disorder, and chronic stress syndrome. So we know that there is an association between uh, these. So our initial thought is maybe CRF has something to do with the effects of ketamine. That's why 
in, we see this um, better effectiveness in people that have comorbid anxiety. And I want to mention though, like we usually view stress as a bad thing. I mean, obviously acute stress is not a bad thing. It's an adaptive mechanism uh, to deal with everyday situations and is necessary for our proper functioning. Uh, now, what we know about stress is that chronic stress is bad because it changes the neurochemistry of our brain and results to, to all the mental disorders that we, we are discussing here. Um, I really like this graph here because it kind of shows that uh, when we have a bit of tiny bit of stress, it's actually good. But then when you get to the higher stress levels, you, you go to these uh, kind of maladaptive uh, adaptations that results to uh, other mental disorders. So you've heard a lot about the forcing test. I want to mention we don't use it as a model of depression. Uh, we've used it as an initial uh, model for um, antidepressant efficacy. So it's the first pass behavioral experiment. Does a compound has any kind of effect or does it not? If then you get a positive effect on the forcing test, then we we'll go ahead and we, we use other protocols to, to validate, uh, in this case, uh, ketamine. So that was a video which uh, doesn't play. So uh, usually what we expect to see is that animals that they receive ketamine, they struggle more. So they kind of have the tendency, they want to escape their current situation while the vehicle animals are just float on the water. So what we have noticed is when I first uh, started doing the experiments was that we had a sex dependent effect. Uh, uh, ex sex of experiment that depend on effect. So what we've seen is that we consistently were able to get the antidepressant response of ketamine when it was administered by male experimenters. However, we, we were unable to get it when it was administered by uh, female experimenters. So that got us thinking a bit and I'm like, is this something to do with stress? Is this something that we are doing wrong? Is it a forcing test? So we're like, okay, let's just, has something else to see if this is true. Um, and initially we've tested this in the, uh, what we call an happiness paradigm. So what it encounters is uh, the mice receive on day one an inescapable shock training. And then on day two, you screen them. So these mice, they have the choice uh, to escape. Uh, what we can call helpless mice, even though they have the choice to escape the shock, they choose to stay in the same compartment and receive the shock. So we choose only the uh, helpless mice in this protocol, and then uh, we treat and 24 hours we test. So what we expect to see is that ketamine, uh, as you see in the male experimenters, um, sorry. with a female experimenter. Uh, but what we've seen in this protocol, uh, the mice, uh, the black mice, uh, they will receive uh, 10 minutes of physical stress uh, every day. And then they will move to the next compartment, as you see in the schematic. Uh, and they will still be able to see and sniff the aggressive mouse, uh, but they won't be able to physically get attacked. And uh, so this phase acts as a psycho psychosocial stress. Then we tested, uh, you know, tested these mice in the sucrose preference. And the mice that they received ketamine by the male experimenter, we could see that they actually have this uh, recovery of, uh, of sucrose preference. However, we haven't seen anything, uh, anything with the female experimenter. And uh, we said, okay, maybe it's not treatment, but maybe can act as prophylactic treatment. So we reintroduce a small stress of one minute of physical stress and then retested for the sucrose preference. And we see that it did 
have prophylactic effect, but only when it was administered by the male experimenters. So then, uh, after all these failures, we're like, what are we doing wrong? But then we started thinking that maybe we are not doing anything wrong. Um, so there was a paper uh, published in Nature Methods in 2014. This was a pain-related paper. But what they showed is that uh, male experimenters, when handled mice, they induce higher level of stress. And then these resu results in stress induce analgesia. Mm -hmm. And they also showed this by measuring corticosterone, plasma corticosterone. So after that, we're like, okay, so what we might be seeing is an interaction between the stress of the mouse prior to ketamine administration, which somehow enhances the antidepressant effects of the compound. So to test this hypothesis, um, uh, that's what I just said. So to test this hypothesis, we decided to infuse CRF uh, into ICV, into the brain uh, by a female experimenter, and then five minutes after the infusion to inject these mice with ketamine. So when we did this, uh, what we've seen is now we're able to replicate the, the male effect or the traditional uh, expected ketamine effect, both in the four swim test and the land herpness sense. And we also performed these experiments with ketamine and HNK, which seem to be behaving the same way. Uh, so that actually, it was a sigh of relief from our side at that point. Um, and then... Uh, the next step is like, okay, if we are able, if there is a true interaction between these, if uh, we uh, inject, pre-treat these mice with a CRF1 antagonist uh, in mice that will receive ketamine by a male experimenter, we will be able to, to reverse the effects of ketamine. So we did this, um, and as you see, the CP526 is a CRF1 antagonist. And what we've seen is that the mice that they were treated with the CRF1 antagonist, uh, they didn't show any antidepressant effects of ketamine uh, in all paradigms that we tried, uh, the lung hypnosis forcing test, as well as uh, sucrose preference deficits induced by uh, the chronic social defeat stress. Um, so that was uh, encouraging, uh, but this is only behavioral outcomes. Um, uh, we wanted to see physiologically in our brain uh, from data that we already know uh, we will be able to see similar effects or is something to do just purely behavioral. Um, first, what we... Um, The next one that it doesn't show either. Try with your computer. Just turn off. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Try with the arrows on the computer. It works for me. It's completely. Oh. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Not that one either. Yeah. They're amazing data. <laughs> They're the best. You can trust me on that. <laughs> Tell that to my reviewers also. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Can you see? I'm going to plug my USB here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Maybe, I mean, it might, I don't know. Yeah. Do we just keep going? Okay. Yeah, maybe that. Sorry. Do, can you talk us through that? Well, <laughs> so what it was supposed to be here, um, <laughs> it was that we did show what Carlos also described in humans that we've seen when uh, ketamine is injected that we see this increase in gamma power in high frequency uh, oscillations, which is a good readout for humans as well as animals for the um, efficacy of ketamine. Uh, and then we were able to, to block this effect with a CIF1 antagonist, further suggesting that our uh, effects are not only behavioral, but we've seen uh, also brain specific effects. Yeah, so uh, here, <laughs> it was supposed to be that. Uh, so um, following up on Lisa's work that she showed the increase uh, on AMPA mediated potentiation in the CA3 to CA1 pathway. Um, we uh, have the ideas that uh, maybe CRF is actually priming the effects of aging K uh, to be able to exert these effects. So we applied, uh, we wash in uh, CRF with uh, aging K uh, simultaneously. Um, and then, but what we've seen is that we've seen the expected potentiation with aging K, but we haven't seen any increase in the potentiation with CRF. Then I um, wanted to uh, uh, move uh, one step further, and there is another pathway that is not very uh, well discussed or mentioned in the hippocampal pathway that we know is more uh, sensitive to stress-related effects. So this is a projection from the entorhinal cortex to the CA1. Uh, so uh, we've used exactly the same protocol as before. Um, so washing simultaneously CRF and aging K and test whether we see this increase in uh, potentiation. So aging K, we know that doesn't increase unpermitted potentiation in this specific pathway. But what we've seen uh, with the washing of uh, simultaneous CRF and aging K, we've seen increase in the unpermitted potentiation, suggesting that actually this is a pathway that might be responsible for our uh, effects and might be important for uh, ketamine's uh, antidepressant uh, effects. And then we were able to uh, block the potentiation with the CRF1 antagonist. Um, so uh, the next question is, okay, it's uh, we applied simultaneously uh, CRF and aging K, but the known projection between entrinal cortex and CA1 is uh, glutamatergic. So it was never reported before if there is a CRF uh, projection uh, from entrinal cortex to CA1. So to first see if, do we actually have this projection? Uh, we perform a tracing study. Uh, we've used uh, CRF cream mouse line and then uh, injected a specific uh, retrograde uh, virus that is absorbed only by Cree expressing neurons. Uh, so what it will do, uh, we will be able to see projections everywhere in the brain that uh, have terminals afferents into the CA1. So when we did this and then we specifically looked in the entrinal core Cortex. I don't know how clear you can see the images, but we can clearly see that there are projections, CRF projections from EC to CA1. Um, then uh, we started looking a bit more on the, on the literature. So as I mentioned, this pathway is specifically involved in stress. And what has been shown is that there is a, a decrease in the synaptic strength of the circuit following uh, chronic stress. Also, EC and frenal cortex is involved in stress responses following exposure to acute stress and development of fear memories, as well as that is involved in condition of odor aversion and context aversion, which is going to be more related with our stress model. Um, so uh, to test whether actually we've seen a decrease in this activity or increase in this circuit activity following stress, um, in vivo, uh, we've used the fiber photometry. So uh, what we do in this 
in this system is that you inject a, a calcium sensor and then you implant specific fibers, optic fibers, and then when you shed the light, you will be able to uh, record the calcium emitted by the specific sensor in the specific region. So this is an indirect measure of, uh, of neuronal activity. So what uh, we get is uh, this fancy system of uh, many lenses and filtering systems, and that's on the right side is what, you, what we see as an output. And then uh, through multiple filters and smoothing, you, we are able to isolate this, uh, these events and then um, analyze them. So this is... Not <laughs> okay, so... Um, it wasn't supposed to be like this. Uh, so what it shows is that uh, this circuit, uh, we've seen increase in in vivo uh, activity when the mice are exposed to the to the male scent, uh, compared to the female scent or control scent, suggesting that this uh, circuit is actually engaged in the in stress uh, stress uh, mediated events. And then uh, to further confirm that it is necessary uh, for stress, um, we've used uh, NDRED. So uh, we injected the inhibitory NDRED in the entorhinal cortex and then uh, injected CNO prior uh, to our behavioral experiment. So using this approach, we are able to specifically inhibit uh, this um, this projection. And what we've seen is when the mice were given uh, a choice between uh, water and uh, male scent uh, from a swab, uh, the, we usually see what you've seen there with the M-cherry, which is our control, and the inhibitor in red that they receive vehicle, that they have this aversion to the male scent. However, when we injected CNO, uh, so inhibiting this um, this projection, we see that uh, they don't show aversion anymore and they actually show preference. So it, we demonstrate that this circuit, yes, it's, uh, it's important for uh, stress. And uh, also what we've seen with ketamine, it might be actually showing that uh, it's uh, specifically involved in ketamines, uh, in ketamines and its present responses. Um, to test that, uh, we've used optogenetics, uh, and how basically this technique works is that uh, we have these specific uh, opsins uh, proteins that they are activated by blue light. Um, so uh, when we inject these opsins, they are getting absorbed by our, by our neurons that express Cree, and then we will be able to specifically manipulate the CRF uh, and trinal cortex to CA1 projection. So what you can see here is that with the traditional electrical stimulate, uh, stimulation, we basically stimulate everything, every neuron that is the uh, uh, specific region. With the light stimulation, if we don't have expression of chanerodopsin, which is our protein that we've used, uh, you don't activate any of these neurons. So uh, as you see on C, we will be able to specifically activate the neurons that express uh, chanerodopsin. <laughs> Um, so initially, before we do anything else, the main question was, what is this projection? Is it glutamatergic? Is it inhibitory? Is it anything else? So using this approach, uh, we, uh, uh, in combination with co cell electrophysiology, uh, basically we stimulated the terminals of this projection and recorded on uh, the CA1. And then after our recording, we applied uh, glutamate inhibitors. And what we've seen that we were able to completely block the effect, suggesting that it is uh, an excitatory projection. So moving on, um, using a similar approach, but this time in vivo, uh, we stimulated the terminals of this projection uh, for five minutes prior to ketamine administration. So, uh, and then 24 hours we tested them in the uh, first swim test. And what we've seen is that the animals that they receive a combination of uh, stimulation of this projection and ketamine were able to induce uh, the antidepressant effects of ketamine in the first swim test. So this is kind of an outline of uh, what we call the CRF state on and CRF, CRF state off. Uh, so, what we are suggesting is that uh, when we have an acute stress just prior to ketamine administration, we have this increase in CRF uh, from the entorhinal cortex to the uh, CA1. 
And then uh, with the administration of ketamine, this enables this increase in glutamate, which results in the antidepressant response. However, when we don't have this increase in CRF, ketamine or aging K is not able to exert this increase in, uh, in glutamate, which is, we believe, mm -hmm. responsible for the antidepressant response. So this is more like a, a schematic of the working model. So in our, I mean, male send, it doesn't have to be the only stressor. Our point is that we need an acute stressor prior to ketamine administration, and that might enhance uh, ketamine's efficacy. So what we believe is happening, we have the initial stress, so we release CRF, which activates the CRF1 receptor, which uh, in turn uh, interact with uh, aging K to increase uh, glutamate release. Uh, and then we have the increase in BDNF and other protein synthesis, uh, which will eventually result to the increase in the implementation in the recruitment of AMPA receptors on the synapses, which is responsible uh, for the uh, final antidepressant responses. So I'd like to thank all the people that they were involved in these uh, in these studies as well as uh, the funding. And I'm sorry for the uh, issues with the slides. Hey, thanks, Jenny. Thanks very much, Bonnie, and for dealing with the technical issues so gracefully. Um, we've got time for some questions. I think um, has anyone got any questions? Oh, hi, Julie. Here's me from Stanford. Um, Can you speak really up, please? We've had a a message that the questions are not coming over very well for the online audience. So please, please shout. Okay, hi, Julie Gethmiss from Stanford. Um, really nice to see this. In, we've actually done this paper in our journal club. Um, super pertinent for our research. Have you guys tried any crossovers with the male female experimenter? Just for like practical reasons, it would be good for us to know if like people like me could be involved at any stage. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we tried this, but we've seen that somehow this effect is persistent. But what we did is if you change the strain of mice to a more anxiogenic or more stress susceptible strain, like the bulb Cs or the 129S, then it doesn't matter who, who injects, male or female, then you get the effects. So our suggestion is when you see these effects, probably it's advisable to use a more stress susceptible strain um, to, to do that, yeah. Any other questions? Um, could I ask, so did you set out, originally you didn't set out to look at the male and female experimental effects? Uh, well, we, did, we didn't. Uh, really? So the, the paper, uh, the Nature paper was out and then we were validating the new batch of the, of the compound and then we weren't able to, to get any effects. So um, that was uh, initiated the whole project of, of getting out what happened and why and then we, we, we bumped into it and then we started actually talking with other other researchers and uh, it's been around for quite some time. It's just people that didn't want to uh, publish it. It's amazing people yeah. are in um, Can I ask a dumb, dumb question from somebody who knows <laughs> nothing about animal work? I mean, if, if uh, male and female experimenters had this different effect, shouldn't, shouldn't they be talked up so that there's no, there's no scent? When they when they work with the animals, so so you've got you know care, you know care, lots of scent. Because my, my my impression is that, that different men smell differently to each other. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so there are other uh, other uh, factors that can affect, um, yes, different scent people uh, smell differently, but what we've noticed is that when you eliminate any kind of, uh, of smell, still you don't get any antidepressant effects. So it seems that this initial stress prior to administration is important um, because when you inject under the biosafety cabinet, which you basically eliminate almost any smell, mice still don't respond in our hands at least. So you think this is a sufficiently reliable sort of stressor that you can rely on this even given the range of different smells from different um, Yes, um, I mean, we did uh, test several experimenters. I didn't show the data, but throughout the manuscript, we have uh, roughly eight to 10 experimenters for each experiment. So uh, I cannot say that for everyone is uh, the same effect, but it seems that an overall um, there is an effect with the a stress effect with the male experimenters, some more than others, but yeah. 
Sarah and then Ben, yeah. How was your email experiment where clothes were by a man before? So uh, we haven't tried this, but uh, other labs have, uh, and they do say that um, they were able to, to get effects. But we haven't tried it. So, um, but from uh, what is going around, it seems that yes, it might you might get away from it if you want to wear your you know, like other people's clothes, I guess. <laughs> and then, yeah, sorry, one quick last question from Ben. Yeah. Are they all female? Sorry. Are they all female in there? No, they are male and female. So. Uh, no, uh, we didn't see any difference. It seems to be pretty consistent. Oh, well, thanks again as well, and especially given all the <laughs>